Hi there, let's change gears and forget about hierarchical and partition in clustering. Today we're going to talk about another approach which is called model-based clustering and in particular we're going to discuss Gaussian mixture models. So let's try to see the cluster. So we have this idea that a cluster is something like in and out. But imagine that we cut this cluster in that direction. Reality is not like this, so the world is not a sharp boundary between being inside the cluster and outside the cluster. But it's more or less like that. So it's a kind of bell-shaped distribution in which something is clearly inside and something is fuzzy at the borders. So clusters are not like in and out, it's something more like diffuse, so we have some probabilities of being in and out. And actually the viewpoint is something like this, so we have a kind of landscape and some, some parts are clearly in, in one of the clusters and some other parts are not that clear. So one approach to this idea is using Gaussian mixture models. The idea is try to find what Gaussians can we plug into the data in order to have a complete description of those probabilities. A model-based clustering aims to find the number of Gaussians, their location and their covariance. So as usual, let's do some plotting. This is the basic ggplot, and we have this function gmdensity2d that creates another layer, and that layer produces a level set, and this level set is simply counting in which areas we have more density of points. But we have a good idea now what's going on there. So you can see that we might have a Gaussian here and another two Gaussians there. As I was saying, this is an empirical density, this is not something computed. But you can see that changing some parameters, like this parameter adjust, we can, have, we can move from having just one big bunch of points to having two clusters or to have something more fuzzy. Actually, in the end, we could end up having some sort of singleton distribution. But this is, of course, not what we want there. So we want to find a balance between accuracy in the number of clusters and some kind of good description of the data, besides the fact that sometimes you are going to live outside of these clusters some of these points. The main ingredient in Gaussian mixtures is the multivariate Gaussian. It's a Gaussian in several dimensions, in this case in two dimensions. So we have to specify something. First of all, we have to define the, the dimension, the, the number of variables. In this case, as I was saying, we have just x and y, but in general we have p dimensions. The second part is the location, so for this Gaussian, the location, the center would be here, for this Gaussian there, and here more, more or less out there. And the third part is the, the hardest one, which is the covariance. Covariance gives us an idea of the variance, of the width of the distribution, but also the orientation. So we have situations like this, in which the, the orientation is more or less parallel to the axis, but sometimes the most accurate description of the Gaussian has rotated axis. So according to the covariance matrix, we have different situations, and clustering can change a lot depending on that. So first of all, we have to define volume. Sometimes we want all the clusters to have the same size, and this is defined by the volume. So we, are, we can have different volumes for each cluster or the same volume for all. The second attribute is the shape, and we can force each dimension approximately the same variance or not. In that case, we talk about a spherical distribution, spherical Gaussians, but otherwise we can have different situations. And the third attribute is orientation. In the simplest case, we force each cluster to be aligned with the axis, so this would be the direction of x1 and this direction x2, but in the more general case we can have any orientation. So as you can see, we can have a myriad of situations, from the simplest one to the more complex one. But the problem is that more complexity means more parameters, because we're going to have more parameters to estimate in this matrix. We're going to use in R this library mclass that comes with this paper, and in this paper you can see a classification in which we're going to use the following legends. So whenever you see an E, that means equal, when you see a V variable, and when you see an I, we're going to see the coordinate. And we're going to move different possibilities for volume, shape, and orientation. So the simplest possibility is the model called EII, and this model has a spherical Gaussians, meaning that we have the same shape in each direction, so this is why we have equal. Of course, it doesn't make any sense talking about orientation when you have a sphere, and we're going to use an equal volume, so all the spheres are going to be the same. If we relax this condition a little bit, then we have diagonal matrices, and you can see here that we have the same orientation according to the axis, and this is why we have this, this parameter i in the third row, okay? But we can play with different possibilities, so the simplest one would be have equal volume for all, but we can also have variable volume and variable shape. And finally, we can have any ellipsoid that we want. In that case, we can have variable volume, variable shape, variable orientation, but we can relax some of these conditions. The only one that we are not changing is the last column, meaning that we don't care about the axis. So the, 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 the principal axis of this ellipsoid is going to be whatever we want. So we're going to refer to these acronyms in order to identify the model. But remember that the, the more general the situation, the more parameters we have to fit. Okay, why are we introducing all these ideas? Because in some cases, spherical ones are the simplest one, 
but sometimes we require some more complex situations. So depending on the shape of the data, you can see that different models are more suitable for the job. So for instance, if you have a situation like this, you have this spiral distribution, then you can define a kind of sticks going out outside there. But when you have situations more simple, like clearly defined, symmetric distributions of points, then the spherical one is going to be the simplest. We're going to use, as I was saying, M-Class, which is a library in version 4 now, and it's really simple and really powerful. So let me show you an example. So let's try to identify the optimal number of clusters. And the, the good thing with M-Class is that it tries all the possibilities and tries to compare them. And what's the criterion to compare them? We're going to use Bayesian information criterion in the sense that we are penalizing for the number of parameters. So, of course, this model is the, the one with the largest number of parameters, so this has to be more penalized than the simplest one. But in the end, you have to try to find that balance between those possibilities. So in this case, the winner is VII, meaning that we have variable volume, Remember that the first letter is for volume. The shape and orientation are with the axis. So these are going to be spherical, but with different size for each cluster. So let's take a look at the data. Here you can see this is the out output of the M class function. You can see that this is the winner. And as you can see, this is spherical with variable volume. And you can see that different sizes, but all the axes are aligned. But of course, this is what happens with circles. You can also plot a density, and but this density is not like the one before. The one before was uh, an empirical density, but here actually you can see these spherical shapes there. And we can also try to plot uncertainties. So what is uncertainty? Uncertainty means that some of the points are not clearly in one of the clusters. So the probability of belonging to different clusters is low, so we actually don't know which one is better. So the second model, the second winner model is VVE, meaning remember that we have variable volume, meaning variable size, also variable shape, in the sense that we have different variants in its dimension. And finally, equal orientation, meaning that we have a new axis, like this one and this one, but you can see that the orientation is the same in those axes. It's like we have rotated X and Y, the original ones, but we are forcing some, the rest of them to be aligned with that direction. Okay, here you can see the final outcome, and you can see that this is not as good as before, but you still could say that it's doing a pretty good job. What about the uncertainty plot? Now, the only point that is uncertain is this one. So we have lost accuracy probably, but we have winning in terms of classification of the data. Now, probably you're thinking, this sounds good, but this is going to be hard to fit, right? And the answer is yes and no. So we're going to use an algorithm called Expectation Maximization Algorithm, or EM. And the idea is really simple. So we're going to start with a given number of Gaussians, and we're going to calculate the probability of one of the points belonging to that, that Gaussian. This is the first step, and this is the expectation aspect. So what's the probability under each Gaussian, assuming that we know that Gaussian? The second step is the maximization one. So we are going to compute these coefficients that are going to tell us which one is more likely. So we are going to color each point according to each group. And then we're going to calculate the new location of the Gaussian. So we're going to do a weighted average of the points in that group and a weighted variance of the points in that group. In that sense, we are iterating because the next time that we are calculating this weight, we are going to use the new Gaussian. So the location and the variance of the new matrix is going to be the one that we have computed in the previous step. Let me show you this with an example. Imagine that we have this cloud of one-dimensional points and then we start with some ideas, some random Gaussians. It could be like that. These are not very good Gaussians because they are too narrow. So typically we prefer to have very more broad Gaussians, but, but you get the point here. And now we're going to compute the probability of belonging to each Gaussian. Of course, these points here are going to be probably red. These points here are going to be probably black. And this is the outcome of this first step. So now we have color each point, and now we recalculate the new location of the Gaussian. So you can see that the mean value of the original Gaussian is shifted to the, to the left. So probably it's going to be more to the right, and here more or less the same. So now we compute the new Gaussian, and here is the outcome, and now we iterate. And each time we iterate, we find a new location, a new variance, and you can see that the learning algorithm is going to find a good classification for this problem. So we still have some uncertainty in some points. So this point here is not, I'm not sure if it's going to be red or black, but in the end you end up with a distribution which is more likely to be correct. Of course, the choice of the model is implicit in the first assumption. So whenever you define this covariance matrix, you're just exploring that possibility. So in order to find the best choice, you have to repeat this algorithm over and over again from the simplest model to the VVV model. And this is it. Of course, there are other model-based methods out there. And the idea is to replace this 
mixture of Gaussians, this superposition of Gaussians with a different covariance matrix, with something more fancy. And probably my favorite one is radial basis function neural networks. And you can see here that we have this idea, this structure of the Gaussian, but instead of coupling them simply by a superposition, which would be just having one neuron here, we're going to have a full architecture of these Gaussians. So we could say that GMM, the Gaussian Mixture Model, is one radial basis function neural network with one output neuron. But of course you can imagine that you can make more sophisticated stuff. And as a bonus track, let me talk to you about hybrid methods. So, so far we've discussed partitioning methods, hierarchical methods, and now model-based methods as if they are in different worlds, but we can actually put them together. So one interesting ap approximation to hierarchical clustering is called model-based hierarchical clustering. The idea is that we're going to replace the concept of distance, and it could be Euclidean or, or Manhattan or whatever, by a density distance. And the idea is that we can play with this hierarchical model, but instead of using the traditional one, we're going to use one of these models, for instance, VVV. And in this case, we end up with a dendrogram, but the good thing is that now we have some sort of probabilities assigned to each cluster.